Welcome to the second edition of Corps Connection, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers monthly vlog, which takes you around the nation and world to see what your U.S. Army Corps of Engineers is working on. I'm your host, Patrick Bloodgood, and this is Corps Connection. In this month's episode, we take you back to the Gulf Coast, where despite being hit by two additional hurricanes, the Blue Roof team persevered and installed its 10,000th roof. Also, we look at how USACE employees who volunteered to deploy to assist with recovery efforts are staying safe during the COVID pandemic. On the Pacific Coast, our Los Angeles district teamed up with the California National Guard to conduct a training exercise, airlifting large sandbags into place if they're ever needed to plug a breach in a levee or a dam. Meanwhile, our Pittsburgh district gives you a behind-the-scenes look at a dewatered lock as they perform maintenance on the Elmsworth lock. A little to the south, the Nashville district is using a brand new air curtain burner to assist them with removing debris from the waterway, keeping boaters and swimmers safe on Lake Cumberland. And St. Paul's district is working with the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources to research and track aquatic species in Big Sandy Lake. And St. Paul's environmental scientists are busy training the next generation of regulators on what to look for as they make jurisdictional determinations on the region's wetlands. Our first story takes us back to the Louisiana Gulf Coast, where the Blue Roof team installed its 10,000th roof. Omaha District's Ferdinand Dietrich was there as the roof was being put on and filed this report. We're here at the home of Megan and Kobe Lear where the Corps of Engineers is currently finishing up its 10,000th Blue Roof under the Blue Roof program here in Lake Charles, Louisiana. So today we've got the 10,000th Blue Roof. So that is pretty significant for this area. From all over USACE, we've got many different districts coming here together to support the people of Louisiana. Then we have these contractors that are coming in and have done just an amazing job, doing great work, you know, really getting people here quickly, getting their crews up and running, and uh, you know, getting their crews on the roof and getting it done. Megan Lear tells us why her and her husband, Kobe, decided to sign up for the Blue Roof program. When Laura came through, we actually had someone come out and pat, patch our roof, which we got a bill for that for $2,800. And they did it wrong, so it was causing more water to get in the house. My parents actually put down money to where we can get on the list, and it'll still probably be like December before we get a roof. And 10,000 is, is no easy feat. And so 10,000 is really an amazing number and we wanna celebrate that today. That we have that many families in this community uh, across these six parishes that we can truly say that you know, they're better off. I've tried to do it myself and it didn't turn out nearly as great as what, uh, what these guys are able to do. All told, the team will have installed 12,970 blue roofs in response to Hurricanes Laura and Delta. With hundreds of USACE employees coming in from all over the nation to support the Louisiana Gulf Coast recovery, keeping them safe and healthy during the COVID-19 pandemic has been a bit of a challenge. But so far, a challenge that the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers has successfully taken on. Whether well, it's installing blue roofs to protect a hurricane victim's home, assessing structural damage to critical infrastructure such as fire stations. They might be able to salvage the foundation, uh, which would be good. Maybe the underground utilities, but everything above ground level is totally demolished. Or hooking up generators to provide temporary power for life-saving facilities. Coordinating all those efforts is a Herculean effort after any disaster. Doing so in the midst of a COVID-19 pandemic makes those tasks that much more daunting. Typically there's four teams that rotate turns coming to these different missions and uh, you know and, and this year uh, just getting a full team together and getting enough people that were willing to come down and work in this environment was a challenge. To cut down on the number of responders needed on the ground, the Corps of Engineers relied on drone technology to do assessments of roofs damaged by the storm. U.S. Army Corps of Engineers Operation Blue Roof. And also used reachback support more than in previous disaster responses. Uh, luckily, we were practiced over this because really since March, much of the Corps of Engineers has been operating in a, in a telework or a virtual environment. For those responders who answered the call to come to Southwest Louisiana, safety precautions such as social distancing and wearing masks were put into place. With the lack of hotels operating in the area, FEMA stepped up to provide housing 
while keeping COVID concerns in the forefront. We've also gotten great support from FEMA, who uh, rather than putting up a big tent for us, uh, built a base camp that has individual rooms and allows everybody to remain healthy. Despite Louisiana having the highest per capita COVID-19 infection rate in the country, the men and women of USACE could not ignore the call for help. Every one of them coming down to South Louisiana, uh, knowing that there is the potential for COVID to be here. At one point, Louisiana had a very high infection rate. They've, they've gotten that under control, but there's still risks associated with being here. And so I can't say enough about the incredible women and men that have come down here and served. I didn't blink an eye, didn't think twice. Um, they needed my help and I asked to volunteer and got put on the list and here I am. You know, we chose this job so that we can help the people and the only way we're going to be able to help them is to get out there. So we have to take the risk of going out there and, and you know, if it's going to better serve the communities and people that need it a lot worse than us, then the sacrifices, that's, that's part of it. More than 300 volunteers from 40 different commands across USACE put their concerns about operating in a COVID environment to the side in order to help the residents of Southwest Louisiana put the shattered pieces of their lives back together. Mike Lash, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Looking to the western part of the United States, the Los Angeles District teamed up with the California National Guard and the state's Office of Emergency Services to conduct a training exercise where National Guard Black Hawk helicopters simulated putting large sandbags in place along a water control structure in Montebello, California. California National Guard Blackhawks place super sandbags along a U.S. Army Corps of Engineers structure at Whittier Narrows Dam in Montebello, California as part of a training exercise to simulate closing a breach during a flood event. The Los Angeles District, working with California's Office of Emergency Services, is training with the 1st Assault Helicopter Battalion, 140th Aviation Regiment, based out of Los Alamitos, California, to be ready should a disaster strike. Our exercise today helps ensure a safe and expedient response when we are called upon in real-world emergencies. With one super sandbag containing approximately one cubic yard of sand and weighing approximately 3,000 pounds, the Guard's Black Hawk helicopter can be used to place a flood-fighting item from the air when it's too dangerous to do so via heavy equipment on the ground. As aviation, we are a unique asset that provides a hard-to-find solution to these complex problems. For the Corps' Los Angeles District, which is responsible for multiple dams and miles of federally owned levees in the Southern California area, training for worst-case scenarios helps to make sure they are ready. Our robust operations and maintenance program ensures that our dams and levees are fully capable to perform to their design criteria. However, we do need to be prepared to respond to the highly unlikely events in which flooding could occur. The importance in responding to any disaster, whether man-made or natural, is to coordinate early and often with our other agencies before an emergency happens. Bolton also says training like this gives agencies a clearer picture as to what tools are available to them. This collaboration provides the opportunity to not only understand the assets at our disposal, but to also build upon common objectives. Objectives that will allow for a timely response should a disaster strike, helping to minimize impacts to surrounding communities. During any emergency, human life and safety are always our priority. Patrick Bloodgood, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, Montebello, California. Locks play a vital role in moving waterborne commerce up and down America's rivers. The Emsworth Lock, just outside of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, along the Ohio River, averages 470 commercial lock-throughs every month and is currently going through a maintenance period, which gives us a rare look inside one of these impressive structures. Hey, and welcome to Emsworth Lock and Dam. I'm joining you today from a dewatered lock chamber. We dewater these chambers to perform higher level maintenance to make sure that we can maintain navigability up and down our nation's waterways. My name is Beth Schneller and I'm the chief of the technical support branch in the Pittsburgh district. I'm standing here today in the middle of the primary lock chamber at Emsworth Lock and Dam. This is a really rare occurrence because we only typically do water a lock chamber about once a year to perform maintenance. To do this, to ensure stability of the lock walls during the dewatering, we install 13 struts across the chamber. Each of these struts can hold 3 million pounds of force if needed. Uh, we, we do this to ensure the stability so that our crew can get in there and do their work. 
It's an absolutely incredible opportunity to showcase the wonderful skilled labor that we have here in, the, here in USAs. Keeping the waterways free of damaging debris is a major effort across the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, including in the Nashville District, which, as Lee Roberts explains, has started using a new tool in Lake Cumberland to help keep boaters and swimmers safe from encountering floating hazards. Equipped with a new 16-foot wide, 60-foot long, and 5-foot tall barge with an air curtain burner, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers Nashville District began incinerating debris on Lake Cumberland this week on the shoreline of Waitsboro Recreation Area in Somerset, Kentucky. The added capability increases the efficiency of the team charged with debris removal operations on board the Pride of the Cumberland. In the past we had a lot of, of piles that we couldn't do nothing with except for burn on the bank and we could only burn at certain times because of the water level being too close to the tree line. So this eliminates all of that. We can burn year round. We can burn anything that we can physically lift and put in there. Stumps that are, are 46 inches that normally we couldn't do nothing with, we, we can now get rid of. Previously, the Corps transported larger debris to Lakeview on one end of the lake to burn, and they chipped wood and burned some debris along the shoreline when conditions allowed it. The average pile of debris on the shoreline is between 40 and 60 yards, which takes two to four days to burn. With the ability to navigate the air curtain burner around the lake, the core can burn debris instantly, processing up to 10 tons of material per hour. It also provides environmental benefits, burning debris faster with less smoke, while keeping smoke and ash away from recreation areas and shorelines. By removing debris off the waters, it's a safety benefit so people can avoid striking whatever might be floating in the waters. And it's also an environment stewardship mission of the Corps where we keep debris out of the water. Every time we get storms, there's all sorts of things that unfortunately make it down into these waters. And we're very fortunate to have an asset like the Pride of the Cumberland to keep our waters clean. Debris creates hazards and affects water quality on Lake Cumberland. The lead operator, born and raised in the area, says it is important to remove objects floating in the lake that could possibly harm friends and family who visit and recreate. Getting wood out of the water, like certain pieces, like ones that stick straight up, they can tear motors off of boats and everything, and it does feel good, like being able to clean up everything, making it nice. We're just here to make the lake come a lot cleaner and hopefully to help everybody through getting it cleaned up and do it more, just get more done. Community partners are definitely excited to have the burner operating because it means clean water and enhances the ability of citizens and visitors to utilize the resources Lake Cumberland provides the region. With the fluctuations that our lake sees, uh, the Corps of Engineers, by with the pride of Lake Cumberland, with the new barge and burner, are making an extraordinary commitment uh, to doing all that they can to clean up uh, this, this lake, this environment, and everything else that goes along with it. As an organization that oversees a lot of various tourism initiatives, workforce development initiatives, and again, quality of life perspective, uh, this is something that will greatly enhance the entire region. This is Lee Roberts reporting for the Nashville District at Lake Cumberland in Somerset, Kentucky. Fish in Big Sandy Lake, Minnesota are getting a little extra attention from the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers St. Paul District and the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources as they study fish in the lake for potential future regulations and projects. Big picture is we're, we're here to study the aquatic species uh, within the Big Sandy Lake and also evaluate um, the dam and the operation of the, the Sandy Lake Dam on these aquatic species. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers is working with the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources to tag fish as part of a five-year study. The larger ones, which we hope to put in, I hope to put in this fish is big enough, um, will go the entire length of the, of the period of our, of our uh, study. You see that, that little device that he has that have little black pads on it? Okay, that is something called a TENS unit. Some of you that may have been to a uh, chiropractor or your 
physical therapist may have had those on your back to relieve uh, tension. The fish are stunned and captured using an electrofishing technique. Put the booms out and drop them in the water. Okay. And then the, the current goes between them. And creates a field. The data may inform future harvest regulations and the possibility of a fish passage. And finally, environmental scientists across the Corps of Engineers work to balance the needs of the nation with those of the environment. Members of the St. Paul District's Regulatory Division held a training exercise with the Department of the Army interns to help them better identify jurisdictional wetlands as they work to become the next group of regulatory practitioners. Uh, my name is Faye Healy. I'm a senior ecologist. I'm with the St. Paul District. Today we are doing what we're calling our delineation short course, so it's a second day, it's a follow-up for our DA interns to learn a little bit more about practical application of wetland delineation. Um, basically, as project managers, we're approving permits for impacts to wetlands, and we need to make sure when we're talking about this that we're talking about the correct areas and the size of the wetlands really matters. So having those boundaries for the wetland is really important. So we've been out here today kind of learning more about how we can do our best to accurately determine what those wetland boundaries are. That is important uh, because we work in regulatory, so we're working to find that boundary between the wetland and the upland, and that helps us issue permits um, and make sure that we're doing the correct thing for moving forward. The thing I find most valuable about doing this kind of training is that it really helps with that communication and collaboration, but it also just makes sure that everybody's on the same page when we see a delineation come across our desk. There's a lot of different ways to review them, but at least we're all all looking at the same things and finding the same outcome time and time again. For me, I got really excited about doing this soil digging. I don't have much of a soils background. I spend a lot of time with the plants. They're above ground. It's what everyone sees. But it's definitely exciting to get in and get in the dirt and see that there are different stories being told by the soils and learning that the different colors and textures all mean something different and that some of them indicate that you might be in a wetland and some of them say that you are not in a wetland. So learning to tell what the soil has to say about wetland delineation was exciting. Well, when you have the staff that's been doing this a long time, there's a lot of institutional knowledge and a lot of times they've actually helped develop the delineation manuals themselves. And so they give you some background and knowledge that you never previously could have found. It really helps bring that next generation of project managers up into their roles. Minnesota and Wisconsin have a lot of water and a lot of organic soils, so it's a lot different than other parts of the U.S. and other parts of the world. So you come in here and you're working in a lot more wetlands than most areas have and it makes it a lot more challenging but also a lot more rewarding. So that does it for this edition of Core Connection. Make sure you like the video and subscribe to stay up to date on all things U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Until next month, I'm Patrick Bloodgood and this has been Core Connection.